We're so glad you're with us this morning. Thank you for, for coming and being part of our worship here at Silver Bay. You bless us by being here, and um, we hope that what we do this morning is just a blessing for all of us and the opportunity for us to draw closer in our relationship with God and in Jesus Christ. My name is Bruce Tamlin, the chaplain, and on behalf of myself and our director of spiritual life, Reverend Dr. Garth Allen, Austin Porth, our, he makes it all real by getting it out online, and Bob Steinforth, our music director, and Eric, our pianist, thank you so much for being with us today and uh, enjoying worship with us. Anybody have a birthday or any, anything uh, going on, an anniversary or anything that we should lift up this morning for anybody? That anybody wants to own up to? <laughs> no, we'll let it all go. Well, I want to say uh, a special welcome to John Brown and some of his family that are in the back there. God, John, John, blessings. Thank you for being with us. Absolutely. Dad, his son and family and daughter and beautiful. Great, great you can be with us uh, this morning. Uh, just a couple of brief announcements. Uh, Centering Prayer is this Friday. It's on Zoom. You can see how you can connect there. Uh, welcome to join us at 10 a.m. on Friday. We do have worship next Sunday. We're here at 10 o'clock uh, next Sunday. Um, this is our last week of choir, but we will be have worship uh, next Sunday for a number of Sundays uh, right on into October at 10 o'clock uh, each Sunday morning. So we hope you can be with us. And as we say at Silver Bay all the time, Garth and I, whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. And we're so glad you're with us this morning. So again, may it be a blessing for us. Now, I'm doing a wedding this afternoon. It's outside. What, what's the verdict? How many think it's going to rain at 3 o'clock? Is it going to rain at 3 o'clock? No, Should I bring my umbrella? No, are, are we going to be okay with this wedding? We're <laughs> better. Um, and they're a little short of guests. Can anybody else? <laughs> <call them? laughs> People have dropped out. And they have a lot of extra food. So I, we'd love to have you all come if you could uh, in terms of that. No, I'm only kidding. A sense of humor. Is a sense of humor important in our faith? Absolutely. Are we not funny people? We are funny. Just look at each other. We are funny people. We truly are funny people. And I hope that we can enjoy the opportunity to worship together and know that God's love for us and God's grace is full. So um, for the next part here, we're just going to do a little moment of God's peace. And what I would invite is just take a moment to say a prayer for somebody that you know that needs prayer. And it may be yourself or somebody close to you. Just take a moment of prayer and then we'll begin with our prayer of invocation. Gracious God, we do pray this morning and that uh, we are so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you in prayer. And that we might be praying for ourselves or for somebody else, but Lord, we pray that our worship this morning is an opportunity for us to drop even to a deeper relationship with God whom we know in Jesus Christ. That through our word and through our prayer, through our silence, through our music, through our presence with one another, that we can come to deepen in our faith, to know of the abundant life that you've called us to. For Lord, we are these women and men on this spiritual journey, and we are grateful that you are never done with us, that you continue to yearn for us to draw deeper and deeper in relationship, and deeper and deeper into the gift of the Holy Spirit that you've given each and every one of us, for, Lord, it is that gift of the Holy Spirit that provides a pathway to know a life of peace and a life of contentment and a life of inner joy. So, gracious God, we ask your blessing upon our worship. This we pray in your name and everyone together said, Amen. So please join me in the call to worship, which is found in your bulletin this morning. Come, let us celebrate the forgiving, reconciling love of God. For once we were lost and fell so far away, now we have been found and welcomed here. 
Know that God's love is lavished upon you forever. We rejoice at the news of forgiveness and hope. Come, let us celebrate and praise the God of love. Amen. Amen. And let us stand and sing our opening hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, number 384. Psalm 27, which is on page 758 and 759 of your hymnal. I will read the, the regular print, and you'll respond with the bold. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil doers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes shall stumble and fall. One thing I ask of the Lord that I will seek after. And I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in the Lord's temple. 
The Lord will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble, will conceal me under the cover of his tent, and will set me high upon a rock. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, I the Lord's face. Your face, O Lord, I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, for you have been my help. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. At this point, uh, we will have our moment for mission, which is basically our time to uh, remind you uh, about our offering. We do not pass the plates here. Uh, there is a basket at the back or several baskets. Feel free to uh, give generously to that. A portion of what you give is uh, given to YMCA World Service, which does uh, great things around the world uh, to meet the needs of people, uh, just basic needs, uh, clean water, uh, food, clothing, orphanages, all sorts of great things. So uh, a portion of what you give uh, goes to that. So please uh, give to that. At this point, I'd like to invite the choir to come forward for this morning's anthem. Guess who's coming to dinner? Spoiler alert, all of us. <laughs> Oh, 
Thank you, choir. Will you pray with me before we look at God's word together? Now, gracious God, we thank you uh, that you are in the business of creating whole people, uh, that you do work in our lives, uh, draw us to grow, and to be transformed. And so we pray as we encounter your word this morning that you would speak uh, through your word and through your spirit, uh, that we would hear and listen and, and take steps uh, to become those whole people. Uh, Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, folks. Um, so as I was thinking about preaching this week uh, and came to the scripture, I was thinking about uh, this movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. I don't, it's an old movie from like 1967, so some of you may know it, some of you may not. Uh, but it starred uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn, and uh, it was actually a well-received film. Catherine Hepburn won one of her many Academy Awards as Best Actress. Uh, the film won Best Screenplay. And I have this list, I'm not sure where I got it, of the 100 greatest films of all time. So when I'm in the dead of winter up here and I have a free night, I'll sort of look through that and see. So this came up on my list. And so I watched it over the winter, and I really enjoyed it. Um, sort of. Hopefully these aren't spoiler alerts because this is over 50 years old. But. So, so Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn have a daughter. Uh, they are raised in a pretty progressive part of uh, the West Coast. I think it's LA or San Francisco. And uh, her daughter is on a trip in Hawaii and she meets Sidney Poitier's character. They fall in love, they get engaged, and then they come home. And uh, the parents think they're pretty progressive until they learn that their future son-in-law is African-American and their daughter is not. And so um, there's all sorts of, they decide we're going to have the, the, the in-laws over, our future in-laws over, and sort of work through this. And all sorts of chaos and hilarity ensues. And it may not seem like a big deal for us. We're 50 so some years on, but in 1967, an interracial couple uh, getting married, there was a lot of cultural uh, baggage and, and challenge around that. And so this was a very uh, progressive, forward-thinking movie at that time. And as I think about the movie, as I watched it, um, this idea of having uh, a, a day leading up to this dinner and all the stuff that was going on, the chaos, it reminded me of this passage that we're going to read today where Jesus goes to the home of Simon the Pharisee. And there's all these sort of regular expectations about what a meal would look like. And, uh, and the chaos ensues as Jesus gets there and a woman shows up. And so very much parallel to this uh, film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And so as I read the passage uh, this morning, it's from Luke chapter 7. I just would invite you to focus on the people that you hear about, think about what they're saying and what they're doing, uh, and sort of imagine yourself uh, at the dinner party. And actually, in the first century, when they had dinner parties like this, there was no such thing as sort of a private dinner party, especially if it was a prominent person's home. People would gather. Uh, they might not be invited for the food, but they were welcome to hear the conversation and sort of listen in on what was going on, to hear the gossip and to, to learn from the prominent people. Uh, so that was certainly the case here. So I'm going to read Luke 7, 36 through 50 this morning. I'm using the New Revised Standard Version, which is the, the pew Bible in most of the pews. So if you want to follow along. Um, so this is it. Luke chapter 7. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, 
Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and another owed 50. When they could not pay, the creditor canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is God's word for us this morning. Thanks be to God. So there's a couple things. In order to gain some under, deeper understanding of the passage, I want to look at a couple things first. The structure of the passage and then the context, sort of the historical uh, and cultural context. So first, the structure. This is sort of, if you're a literary nerd, you might understand this, but there are uh, different ways that scholars sort of interpret literature, uh, all sorts of literature, not just the scriptures. And, and one of these uh, ideas they use is called ring composition. And so this chapter is divided into these seven unique sections. And there are matching bookends. So there's, at the beginning and end, there's one ring. And then you step in, there's another ring another ring, and then in the center is actually the pinnacle or the climax of the story. Uh, it's very common among the prophetic writings in the Old Testament and in certain places in the Gospels. And so we're going to look at that, why he arranged it this way, what Luke is trying to communicate. So on the first verse, 36, we have this introduction, and then at the end, in 49 and 50, we have the conclusion. So this is the first pair. Then we have verses 37 and 38, and then 44 through 48, where the woman and Jesus are interacting. So this is the second uh, pair. Then we have 39 and 40, and 42 through 44, where Jesus is having these conversations with Simon the Pharisee. And then right in the middle, we have this parable uh, that talks about the creditor and the two debtors. And so the point is that Jesus is speaking in the center, and everything is pointing to him, uh, his interactions with both parties, and his role as sort of the centerpiece of both this story and Luke's entire narrative. Um, so that's just a, a little interesting thing if you read the text closely that you can see that. And then there's the cultural and historical background. The first century was very different. Uh, first century in Israel, very different from 21st century America. And so there were definitely rules about how you ate together, um, how you shared table fellowship. And this, I want to read uh, a quote from one of my seminary professors, Joel Green, who wrote this about fellowship around the table in the ancient world. Green says this, In the ancient Mediterranean world, mealtime was a social event whose significance far outdistanced the need to satisfy one's hunger. To welcome people at the table had become tantamount to extending intimacy, solidarity, and acceptance. Table companions were treated as though they were one of one's extended family. Sharing food had encoded messages about hierarchy, inclusion and exclusion, boundaries, crossing boundaries, who ate with whom, where one sat in relation to another person at the table. Such questions as these were charged with social meaning. As a consequence, to refuse someone fellowship at the table with people was to ostracize them and to treat them as outsiders. So this dinner is not just sort of getting together to share pizza. It's a pretty big deal. And so in Jesus's day, it was traditional uh, that a guest would be greeted with a kiss on the cheek. 
And then guests, if they had come some distance, even if they hadn't, were given some water to wash their hands and feet. Um, and that's because they dined around low tables and they sort of reclined on one side with their feet out behind them. It was very different and you didn't want your feet next to someone's head while you're eating. So, um, and they gave some olive oil, which was plentiful and people would use it to anoint their heads uh, if their hair had gotten dusty or sweaty from the, the trek. After all these rituals had taken place, uh, the host would say grace or a prayer before the meal. And then finally, uh, the host would seat people in a specific order. Uh, the eldest or the most prominent guest would be seated first, and then the host would seat people around them. It was very important that you didn't uh, sit where you weren't supposed to sit. And then finally, at last, the meal would begin. And as I said earlier, if there were public figures there or prominent people, um, guests from around the community would gather around and they didn't have like a formal dining room like you might have in your home. It was sort of an open colonnade so they could gather around and sort of see in and hear what was going on. And so especially because Simon was a, a Pharisee, prominent leader in the Jewish faith, and Jesus was this sort of at the beginning of his ministry. So people are hearing, who's this sort of itinerant preacher who's working miracles? He's from this backwater in Galilee. What's he all about? So people wanted to be a part of this. And lastly, first century Judea was a patriarchal culture. And so there were many rules about men and women interacting. Um, they were both written and unwritten. And it really governed how you, a male could interact with a female and vice versa. And basically the men had all the power and the status and they, were, they sort of set the tone. So these interactions between men and women were fraught with danger and anxiety because they had a profound impact on whether you could worship uh, at the temple that week or not, if you were clean or unclean, um, whether there was honor or shame in your interactions. And so all this is going on before this meal even starts. So as we look at this passage, we want to talk about the parable first. Then I want to talk about the significant people, Jesus, uh, the woman, and Simon. And then I want to give us some points to think about, points to ponder before we uh, move on with our service. So that's where we're headed. So the parable, uh, right in the center, verses 41 and 42, talks about the creditor and two, debt, uh, two debtors. And it says they owe, one owes uh, 50 denarii, the other owes 500, or 5,000 denarii. The denarii was just a day's wage for a laborer. So in our terms, it might be the one person owed 5,000, the other person owed 500,000. So this is a pretty significant debt for either person. And they were in trouble. If they couldn't pay up, there was all sorts of consequences up to possibly becoming enslaved because you didn't pay your debts. And so uh, these two are in deep trouble because they owe a lot of money. And then uh, the creditor steps in and forgives both debts. He forgives them both. It doesn't say why or anything, just he forgives them. And it's interesting to me that in the context of this story, the issue is sin. The woman is a sinner, they say, and Simon is concerned that she's approaching Jesus because she's a sinner. And Jesus equates this sin with death. And I think that's interesting because uh, the idea uh, of death, actually it's found in the Lord's Prayer, and right? we pray for uh, forgive us our trespasses. The Greek word there can be translated as debt as well. So some churches say debt or debtors. So the idea that sin, whether it's great or small, whether it's intentional or unintentional, has consequences uh, that we not necessarily can overcome on our own. No amount of work, labor, uh, perseverance can help us save ourselves. Uh, Bruce talked about it last week, the grace of God. We need God's grace. And so we all come up short in this list of sin. Yet, uh, the creditor is not like creditors we may be familiar with. If you've ever owed money, you know the creditors will call you on the phone, they'll drive you crazy, they'll do everything they can to get their money from you. Yet this creditor is our gracious God, uh, who cancels the debt and releases the two debtors from all of their past obligations. Their slate is wiped clean, there's no need for guilt or for shame or for self-recrimination, they're totally free from their past sin. And this was pretty much a revolutionary teaching uh, in Judaism, uh, where if, if you fell short, you had to go offer sacrifice, and it was this never-ending thing. 
Uh, for, so this teaching of Jesus that sin could be entirely wiped away uh, was really an upside-down, crazy, radical thing in Jesus' day. So that's sort of the parable, uh, the basic meaning of the parable as I understand it. So let's, before we look at the people, I just want to look at verse 1, the introduction, or verse 36, the first verse. It's, it's pretty basic, but it, we might gloss right over it. It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. Sounds like Jesus just went over and sat down, like there was none of these preliminaries. Can you imagine going to someone's house, they invite you for dinner, and you blast through the door and just go sit at the table? It's not how it works, right? If you go to the door, they may ask you to take your coat. You may give them uh, a gift of flowers or a bottle of wine. There might be appetizers, and you sit and have a conversation before you go to the dinner table for the meal. These are not sort of hard and fast rules, but that's sort of how it works uh, in America. And it was the same. that There were certain things that happened. Simon does none of those things, as we learned as we read through. He doesn't give Jesus water for washing his hands and feet. He gives him no oil for his head. He doesn't greet him with a kiss. And I think Jesus, quite frankly, was probably offended. And so he just blasted through and sat at the table. And he was probably 30 at this time, so he certainly wasn't the oldest person. He certainly wasn't the first person to be seated. Uh, I think Simon probably thought of him as some country bumpkin and just was not going to give him all this attention, but Jesus sort of went right to the spot and sat. So this, uh, how do you say, the kids would say, this is awkward, you know, like this is not, like I'm sure everyone was watching and saying, what is happening here? This is uh, a mess. This dinner is not going like it's planned. So they sat there in stunned silence, and then this woman comes in, right? And we learn about the woman in verses 37 and 38, and then 44 through 48, and we don't know much about her. We've never given her name. She doesn't speak a word. Um, she lived in that city, we know that, and we know that she was a sinner. We don't know what her sins were. It's very interesting. If you read commentators, a lot of them will say, oh, she was a prostitute. It doesn't say that. It just says she was a sinner. And they might have clues about that, but really, the scripture doesn't say. So we have no idea what her sins were. We know that she knew who Jesus was. When she heard that he was coming to this dinner, she went there. Um, she wanted to be at Simon's house to see what was going to happen. Perhaps she heard Jesus preaching the good news as he walked around the village. Uh, the, the good news of that there's forgiveness for everyone, uh, that there's love for all. Maybe as she was standing around, she witnessed how Simon had disrespected and mistreated Jesus. And she started weeping, whether that's because of her own sinfulness or because Jesus was treated in this disrespectful way. She is overwhelmed and starts weeping. I think she believed Jesus' words of forgiveness, and she couldn't understand why anyone would mistreat this man in such a way. So... And I, I'm just impressed by her response. She, she's overwhelmed with tears, uh, and she says, ah, the tears can become the water to wash Jesus' feet. She doesn't have a towel or rag, but she has her hair, so she uses that. Uh, the ointment that she had with her, she used that to anoint Jesus because he wasn't given any olive oil. She kissed his feet as a sign of honor and respect for Jesus. Again, this incident probably shocked everyone. If they were already shocked, they were at this point. Uh, because it was, in that time in Israel, women covered their heads. They didn't, no one saw a woman's hair except a husband and wife when they were in private. And so for, in a public place, for a woman to uncover her hair and, and show it in this way would have been considered very shameful for her and for the other people to be witnessing it. And this perfume was likely couple types of perfumes they had it that day. One was nard and one was myrrh. Very strong fragrances. I think it would have, in that area, would have hit you like if you walk into the fragrance counter at like Macy's or somewhere where it's just overpowering. So there's this smell, this scene. Um, and by wiping Jesus' feet with her hair and weeping and kissing his feet, she's just breaking all sorts of boundaries. She's just crossing over them. Um, and if she was considered a sinner and was unclean or impure, 
this interaction was extremely unseemly for everyone who witnessed it. It went against all of the standard expectations. And the woman took a huge risk to go in front of Jesus. People already thought of her as a sinner. What if he rejected her? What if he shamed her and said, oh, please get away from me, you are a sinner. Uh, he doesn't do that. But this was a huge risk of humiliation and shame, but she wasn't gonna work, she wasn't gonna be dissuaded about honoring Jesus in the way that he felt he deserved. So whatever else we can say about this woman is that she was a woman of action. She saw a need and she fulfilled it. And she had deep faith. Uh, none of her words are recorded. We don't know anything she said, but her faith prompted her to take action. Uh, her faith also opened her up to forgiveness. Uh, as we read the parable, we know that, that the creditor forgave both. Um, and with experience of God's great forgiveness, she realized how great Jesus's and God's love for her was, and that helped her love greatly as well. And then let's look at Simon, Simon the Pharisee, from verses 39 and 40, and then 42b through 44a. We know a little bit more about Simon. He's a Pharisee, which means that he was well-educated, probably uh, wealthy, or at least had means, um, and that he was concerned about the Mosaic Law. He wanted to make sure that he followed it scrupulously, that he was doing both the moral law and the ceremonial law. He was doing all the right actions. And he was probably a respected member of that community. Everyone looked up to the religious leaders uh, in Jerusalem and Judea that day. Um, it's interesting that he invited Jesus to dinner. It demonstrated he had some interest in hearing from this peasant, pastor, preacher, and purported miracle worker. He wanted to, what's this guy all about? We think of the woman as a woman of action. Simon was a man of words, lots and lots of words. And throughout the entire story, we hear him talking. In the beginning, he says he talks to himself. He said, how can this man be a prophet? Uh, but he's not really doing anything. He's not greeting Jesus in the way, providing the actions that would have been normal and expected at that time. Simon was quick to judge both Jesus, how can this man be a prophet, and the woman. She must be a sinner. How does, you know, so he's, he's quick to judge and quick to speak his mind on those things. He does say a couple of interesting things. He calls Jesus teacher or rabbi, uh, which meant that he acknowledged that Jesus was learned and honorable uh, on some level. Uh, this, however, begs the question, why didn't he treat Jesus with honor if he thought he was an honorable man? Uh, why didn't he give him the customary welcome and greeting? And he also correctly interprets the parable if a bit half-heartedly. He says, I suppose the one whom he canceled the greater debt. That's the one who will love him more. And as with most of Jesus' interactions with the Pharisee, Simon seems to be portrayed as the villain. Uh, although he was very religious, uh, he continued to miss the more weighty matters of the law. He missed aspects of the kingdom of God like mercy, grace, compassion, forgiveness, love, etc. Now we come to the central character, Jesus Christ. In this story, Jesus continues to defy our expectations. Uh, he eats dinner with a Pharisee who in general opposed him at every step. Um, why does he do this? Because I think no one is beyond the love and forgiveness of God, even the Pharisees. And remember the parable, both debtors are forgiven. Uh, does this mean that Simon was forgiven? I think perhaps it does. Uh, I wanna draw your attention to the question that he asked Simon. He says to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her? <laughs> you really know that she's there. Uh, Simon didn't see her, actually. He saw only her sin and her reputation. He failed to see her generous spirit, her risky acts on Jesus' behalf. And Jesus, on the other hand, begins always by seeing people on the margins, uh, by noticing them, by giving them his time, attention, his ear. Jesus used this incident to once again remind us that actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. The woman said nothing in the whole passage. Simon's words were everywhere, but her actions are, are the important thing. Um, his interactions with Jesus, his words actually caused all of the chaos. 
uh, in his inaction, I mean, by not doing the things that he was supposed to do. Finally, Jesus used this awkward reaction at a dinner party to remind those present of certain aspects of the kingdom of God. First, he reminds us of faith. Faith helps us to see Jesus clearly. It helps us to see one another clearly. It helps us to see ourselves more clearly. He reminds us of forgiveness, uh, forgiveness that's available to everyone and forgiveness that we should be giving to everyone. He reminds us of love, love that is able to permeate and condition all of our words and all of our actions. And lastly, in that last verse, it talks about peace, peace that accompanies us along life's journey and comforts us along the way. Jesus hits these main themes of his ministry, faith, forgiveness, love, and peace. So just to tell you, this story has really captured my attention, my imagination. I first read it uh, on a morning in July, and I've been reading this section two or three times a week since mid-July. It just, it's just really struck me, and I can't get it out of my head. And I've been hoping to have an opportunity to share it with you. And so now comes the challenging part. I think I've really ripped this story apart and tried to break it down so we see what's actually going on. Um, but I think there are some things that we need to think about that are gonna actually call us to do something, to action, to live differently, uh, to become, as, as Bruce prayed this morning, the hands and feet uh, of service and faith to Jesus Christ. So I have three simple points. You can come up with others. The first point is this. We need to be people who see the need and meet the need. We need to see the need and meet the need. How often do we, how often do I just miss people in need every day? I got my head down, I'm walking across campus, I've got appointments, I'm in and out of the grocery store, whatever it is, I'm just, you know, laser focused. I'm not paying attention at all to the people around me. And so how often do we do that? Not give people our attention. Uh, do we not prioritize people? Um, and then, once we spot a person in need, how often do we just sort of move beyond it? Um, instead of acting, we just sort of say, how can I act? I've got busy, I have a busy life, I've got things to do. I think instead we should ask ourselves, how can I be the hands and feet of Jesus in this moment for this person? If the way to meet the need is unclear, I would suggest we pray about it. Ask God for wisdom, insight, and discernment. Uh, I find that God's answer to my prayers often involves me. Me meeting the need in some way. And I do want to caution about praying for these needs. Because uh, we can use prayer, uh, I think, un, uh, unaware as a way to distance ourselves from the need. Uh, we can say, I'll pray for you. Right? When I say that to someone... Well, it sounds very holy and religious that I, I'll pray for you. Um, and then I go my way and I may even pray about it, but I might not do anything about it. Maybe God will send someone else to meet the need, but I believe if he's given us eyes to see it, he wants us to meet it. So uh, your prayer is always good, but beware that you're not using it to distance yourself from actually getting your hands dirty to getting engaged with the, the messiness of people's lives. Um, Jesus got his hands dirty. He engaged, and so should we. So we should see the need and meet the need. The second thing I noticed was the radical inclusivity of Jesus' ministry. Radical inclusivity. He would eat with anyone. Pharisees, how many times in the Gospels do we hear he was a friend of sinners eating with tax collectors and prostitutes? He would eat with anybody. And I think he just was like, whoever you are, you're a man or a woman, you're welcome in the kingdom of God. Uh, if you have a great education or you've never been to school a day in your life, you're welcome in the kingdom of God. If you're a notorious sinner who we don't even know your name, like the woman in today's story, you're welcome in the kingdom of God. If you're a prominent religious person uh, who talks a lot and does very little, you're welcome in the kingdom of God, like Simon the Pharisee. There is no one who is excluded from participation in the kingdom of God. No. All debts can be forgiven. All are invited and all can be welcomed into the inclusive kingdom of God. Therefore, we should display radical inclusivity in our interactions with others. Uh, the people that we encounter, uh, they should see us as ambassadors of Christ, and we should welcome them in, no matter who they are, where they come from, what their backstory is.
radical inclusivity. That's the second thing. And then I just want to touch on these, these sort of marks of the Christian faith. Jesus brings out faith, forgiveness, love, and peace. These are the marks of the kingdom of God. They're the marks of the gospel. Have faith in God. If you don't have faith, ask God to give you faith or increase your faith. Forgiveness. Embrace God's forgiveness for you and be quick to forgive one another. Don't hold grudges. Love. God loves you, each and every one of you. He loves you deeply, madly, unconditionally. Therefore, we should love one another in the same manner. God grants us peace, shalom, harmony, well-being. These are ours um, to seek. Uh, we should seek peace. We should embrace the peace that we have. We should give it to others. So peace, love, forgiveness, and faith are your birthright as a child of God. Believe in them. Embrace them. Share them with everyone you meet today and always. Amen. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, uh, we thank you for this story uh, that is uh, alive, even though it happened 2,000 years ago, that it, your word still speaks if we have ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, I pray for us that we would be a people who are engaged in your work around the world and around our neighborhoods and in this room, uh, that we would actually really truly see each other that we would listen to each other and care for each other in ways uh, that you desire us to do, uh, that we would uh, emulate Jesus Christ uh, today and always. Thank you uh, again for your work. We invite your spirit to continue speaking as we move through our service and throughout whatever you have for us the rest of this day. Lord, we do love you and we thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together 328. this opportunity to worship together such a beautiful experience and so grateful for you all so we come to a time of prayer where we can pray and as we always do at Silver Bay a petitionary prayer so I'll begin our prayer and then invite you to offer a prayer a, a something of concern something you'd like to lift up a joy something you'd like to pray for and as you pray for that out loud, we will listen. And upon your finishing, we'll all respond by saying, Lord, hear our prayer. I hope that you feel comfortable in the beauty of this chapel, in the warmth of the, all of us here. We may not each know each other, but you know what? We come together as a family of faith this morning. So I hope you feel comfortable lifting up a prayer and we would all respond by saying, Lord, hear our prayer. So let me begin our prayer. 
O oh, gracious God, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, and we have heard your word this morning. And your word is about love and forgiveness, inclusivity, and grace. Lord, we give you thanks for your word and for this story in Scripture that so highlights the life and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we move into the rest of this day and this coming week, let us know of this story in such a deep way that we would be your hands and feet, that we would be able to see others, that we are able to forgive ourselves and others, and we are able to love. And Lord, we, we always, we come to worship on a Sunday morning, and whether we come one Sunday a year here or we're here many, many Sundays, we always come with something on our heart, something we're concerned about, some joy, some concern, something that, that Lord, that we'd like to lift up in prayer to you. So, Lord, we take some time now just to be in prayer and lift up to you those people, those joys, those concerns we have. And we do that now. Lord, I pray with gratitude the blessings that you've bestowed on the Silver Bay family and that we can in faith and love honor continue the many beautiful things that occur here not only for the Silver Bay community but the greater community as well. Lord hear our prayer. Lord I pray for all the families that are with us uh, today. Family members that may not be with us but are in different parts of the country Silver Bay is so much about family. Lord, we ask your blessing upon families that are here, families everywhere. Lord, hear our prayer. Father, thank you for uh, my father getting a pacemaker this week. Uh, Lord, we pray for his healing uh, and full recovery. Lord, hear our prayer. schoolers and their mom who lost uh, a beloved friend of mine and, and their dad this week. Uh, Lord, be with them. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, for all the students and administrators and teachers going back to school this week, Lord, I pray that you would just um, give them your peace and your wisdom and um, your strength. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, I pray for the couple that was with us this morning for our communion service who were celebrating a 40th wedding anniversary today. And I pray for the couple that's about to be married this afternoon. Lord, be with both of those couples and all of those that are celebrating a birthday or an anniversary or some significant date. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, I lift up a few names that uh, I would like to hold in prayer. A dear woman named Katie and her mom, Martha, who's caring for her day in and day out. Lord, we ask that you would have a breakthrough in Katie's health. And Lord, I pray for Linda Fish McGow, who is struggling uh, mightily in this last stages of her life in hospice care. May she be pain-free. We ask your support of her husband, Lou, and family members who are with her. And Lord, I pray for all of those that uh, are <coughs> dealing with physical or emotional or spiritual challenges, that Lord, that your healing touch 
and guiding hand would be upon them all. Lord, hear our prayer. Gracious God, I pray for the people of Afghanistan, the people of Haiti, and those around our country who, from flooding or storms or hurricanes, are being challenged in so many ways. Lord, we give you thanks for those that are caring and reaching out and attempting to support all of those that have been, that, whose lives have been so disrupted. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, I pray for your grace, for when each of us sees another that does not look like us or speak like us, that we see your love in their heart and in their eyes, and that we share our love with them. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. So gracious God, we lift up all of our spoken and our unspoken prayers in confidence, knowing that you do hear us that you do love us, that you do forgive us, and your mercy and grace is so full and rich and complete for each and every one of us. And Lord, we now take a moment to say the prayer that you have taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
the house where hands will reach beyond the wooden stone to heal and strengthen, serve and teach and live the word they've known. Hear the outcast and the stranger.
congregational amen. There are four parts to it, and if you want to add your own, that's perfectly acceptable. So we're going to start out, we're going to hear a soprano line, we're going to hear an alto line, a tenor line, a bass line, and whatever else you come up with, because God is not a music critic. <laughs> refreshments right outside in the garden. God bless. Have a great rest of your day. Amen. So everybody at home, thank you so much for being with us. Blessings upon you. And you know what? You mean so much to us. Although you're not with us here in the chapel, you are with us in spirit. And we're so grateful for that. Blessings to you all. We'll hope to see you next week, too, again, online. God be with you. Again, thanks for being so much with us. Take care. Amen.